Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Michael Doctor. He is co-founder and CEO of Doc Health. He is also the former clinical director of innovation at Boston Children's Hospital, co-founder at Health Voyager and Hack Pediatrics. Michael, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. So first of all, how are you and your teams doing during the pandemic? Uh, We're doing well, thank you. It's, as you can imagine, a curious time for everyone. Uh, We are fortunate to be a remotely run business operating in the cloud and super comfortable with Zoom. So um, it's kind of business as usual in many respects for us, Um, but we're certainly in our growth phase and um, it's, it's trying times for everyone. We feel very fortunate. Yes, of course. Yes. And I would love to know, you know, what led you from the bedside to innovation and then, of course, uh, the natural progression into having your own startups? Yeah. Well, I don't know how long this podcast is, but uh, I'll try and keep it (laughs) short. Um, You know, so I'm a pediatric gastroenterologist at Boston Children's Hospital and really have always been a technologist at heart and, you know, had an entrepreneurial spirit. And really throughout my uh, times at Boston Children's Hospital, certainly during my fellowship, I had a bunch of downtime and it was around the time of the, the birth of the app store. And I became enamored with um, helping to build apps and and built a few, uh, didn't actually do the coding, but worked with folks that, that could. And it got really into design and uh, user experience and really began to appreciate the opportunities of mobile devices and their implications in healthcare. And at the time, amazingly, no one was really thinking about those opportunities at, you know, arguably the world's best children's hospital. So I kind of stepped into that role and became a thorn in the side of our CIO and CMIO and said, you know, we need to be thinking about more mobile tools. And um, I helped usher in the the first secure messaging vendor uh, at Boston Children's Hospital and you know, changed the way we kind of communicate um, at the hospital. And that sort of, you know, be, was the beginning of my entree into you know, mobile technologies and the opportunities in healthcare and Um, Along the way, as you mentioned, you know, co-founded a group called Hacking Pediatrics, which um, really brought engineers, designers, and um, entrepreneurs together to help build solutions for um, pediatrics and healthcare in general. And so just got tons of exposure to startups and and entrepreneurship and all the exciting things about the startup ecosystem and helped to build our innovation program as the clinical director there and, and kind of wanted to throw my own hat in the ring as I had plenty of ideas and had the good fortune of meeting my co-founder, who's a user experience designer, and the rest is history. And that's a pretty powerful combination right there. <laughs> I love that one of the first um, really big innovation initiatives that you took on was a communications or messaging app among providers in the hospital. Can you tell us more about that? I know personally, because of a lot of our work at Untold, focusing on medical storytelling, that provider communication is such a major challenge. And when it's inefficient or when um, when people aren't able to do that in, in a way that's coordinated really well, it really increases the risk of, of there being safety problems or, or just inefficiencies as well. And, and it's really just a burden to the system. Uh, so what inspired you to tackle provider communication? Well, as you know, and I've already suggested, you know, communication is everything and getting the team on the same page in whatever fashion is uh, essential to good patient care and, and frankly, um, good provider care. Um, the, you know, the, the dawn of kind of secure messaging was, uh, you know, in early 2012, 2013. And I, I, we all had familiarity with text messaging on our smartphones. And I was amazed at, you know, the fact that we weren't using that technology in healthcare. And so I looked at the marketplace and saw there were a couple of vendors that had begun to tiptoe into that space and was fortunate to meet the folks at Tiger Text, which was sort of the the first and biggest uh, secure messaging vendor. And we became their first academic, uh, large academic medical center client. I since went on to develop a great relationship with that team and and was an advisor to them for a while. But um, we, you know, that was sort of my pet project at Boston Children's. And we, you know, implemented that in 2013. Um, 
there's a story behind that, which is interesting if we have time, but uh, suffice to say that it was um, a really valuable tool that had, you know, ushered in sort of a, a new, better way to communicate as, you know, as teams and um, tried to move away from this sort of de facto communication tools of um, pagers and things that are kind of one way, really, um, frankly, painful ways to communicate. Well, well, you've you've hooked us with a, an opening to another story, and I I can't hardly uh, not take the bait. So, oh, uh, is, uh, is there a way to tell it briefly? So, yeah, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so, you know, the, the short version is that um, we had, um, you know, as a sort of project lead, we had a thoughtful plan to roll out. Um, this, you know, really disruptive, um, hopefully in a good way, disruptive tool to the um, to the masses at Boston Children's Hospital. And we had a small pilot group of about 30 users that, you know, were testing out the technology and seeing what worked and what didn't work and finding, you know, Wi-Fi dead zones and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, something that kind of hit the, um, the radar quite uh, significantly was that there was an anonymous attack on the network at Boston Children's Hospital uh, related to a, a patient issue that was uh, hit national news and the FBI was involved and all that. But at the moment, there was wow. a sudden loss of all of our connectivity at the hospital. And so we had no real good way to communicate. Uh, and very quickly, we realized that we had an opportunity to roll out this tool, which we had, again, thoughtful plans for a, a slow sort of um, <laughs> you know, implementation. And we said, OK, let's uh, let's hit this and go live. And we went from 30 users to 800 users in about an hour. And, wow. Um, that was trial by fire, um, but it was a great way to implement a communication tool and you know, proved to be a very valuable tool at that time and, and beyond that. Oh, wow. Okay. Take us into the situation room and, <laughs> and truly the storytelling that, that had to happen in that moment for that decision to go green light. Gosh, yeah. I mean, it was um, it literally there was a situation room um, and, you know, all the sort of players, uh, you know, chief uh, information officer, chief medical information officer, chief nursing officer. And um, we were faced with, you know, a really, a really significant problem in a you know, major academic medical center of, um, you know, how do we communicate um, our email? If I recall correctly, our email was down, our, our uh, Wi-Fi telephony system was down. Um, our pager system may or may not have been working. So really our, our essential communication tools um, were down uh, and we were trying to figure out what was going on, frankly. And, you know, we had this new tool that was, the, you know, potentially deployable to, um, you know, people's personal devices um, and had the redundancy of Wi-Fi and, and cellular connectivity. So it was a kind of way around and uh, yeah, again, we had done lots of planning and um, thought around the implementation of this, but um, just you know, made the decision in the moment that um, this feels like risk um, and benefit. The benefit far outweighs the risk, and we we've already been thoughtful about how to do this right. So let's get the word out that this is the tool. So I think we put the um, you know, message up on the internal internet. Um, and message to as many of the providers as we can through whatever channels we had that um, we're going to go live. And again, in that afternoon, uh, we went um, you know, from 30 to 800 or so uh, users very quickly. And that uh, proved to be a great you know, tool in the moment um, yes, that had durability yes. beyond that. Absolutely. And so obviously the urgency led to the decision making, but also the credibility that had already been established um, amongst your team and, and the rest of the leadership to move yeah. that forward so quickly. Tell us how those formative experiences led you to develop uh, and co-found Doc Health. Well, you know, I think that there are a couple of factors that obviously in uh, in retrospect, <laughs> that seemed perfectly clear. But, you know, I, I learned a lot from the, the Tiger Tech experience in that um, it was a very consumer-like experience. Um, and it was something that I think is sadly missing in healthcare. And so, um, you know, to have a consumer-like tool like secure messaging um, and the ability to sort of deploy it in a really well-designed, user-friendly um, experience uh, in a mobile tool um, was something that was really compelling to me. So that, that stuck, uh, number one. Number two, just, you know, with my role in clinical informatics and sort of seeing what the electronic health record is like and all the sort of good and bad elements of it, I, I, I saw this unique opportunity that there was really nothing to help with 
managing tasks as a team. And I had the benefit of working in innovation and in other industries that really were transformed by these tools of collaboration and project or task management. So things like Jira, and Trello, and Basecamp, and Asana, and Wonderlist in my in my personal life. These are all you know wonderfully um, you know successful and, and and powerful tools that really transformed how I you know dealt with my shopping list at home with my wife as well as <laughs> our sort of software project management. And mm-hmm. thought, gosh, you know, how is this not uh, available in healthcare to help people get coordinated with their efforts to help manage patient care, to help manage all the to dos of you know, my clinical practice. And so we sought out to build just that. And the the big hoop, of course, that you had to jump through was HIPAA compliance as you're trying to create a project management software specifically for healthcare providers, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we were fortunate to be, you know, born and raised at Boston Children's Hospital in our innovation and digital health accelerator. So my uh, co-founder, technical um, co-founder, uh, CTO was the former lead engineer of the innovation program. And so he had, you know, uh, the wonderful skill set of knowing full well how to build HIPAA compliant tools, um, within, you know, a, an enterprise healthcare, uh, uh, environment. So that was, you know, foundational to our, um, you know, you know, our development was really being HIPAA compliant at, at our core from the, from the foundation, not kind of putting a HIPAA wrapper on something that already exists. But beyond that, we also, you know, wanted to spend a lot of time, you know, bringing in the sort of clinical and administrative elements of real practice that um, make, you know, Doc Health not just HIPAA compliant, but also really specifically built for healthcare and the nuances and, and sort of workflows that are part and parcel of healthcare. Absolutely. You know, it's something that I really respect about Doc Health is the story. I, I would call it, um, of course, you have a strong go to market strategy, but you also have a strong go to market story, if you will. Yeah. Um, and it, it sort of centers around provider burnout, especially with regard to administrative tasks. Um, we recently did actually create a study around provider satisfaction and burnout, and we've, mm-hmm. we studied a lot of the validated tools to measure it. And and your your organization's absolutely right that administrative overload is a huge reason for burnout, um, and also you know lack of coordination or lack of communication and connection with your healthcare team is another contributor. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is you know it was really my own experience as a, a pediatric gastroenterologist and and really struggling with all this sort of you know, to do's that come as part of taking good care of your patients. And and that's the sort of stuff that would weigh on me as a provider, especially when things fell through the crack. You know, when I forgot to do something because it was one of 20 tasks and it just simply had no good system to capture them or delegate them or, or track them. And so again, it was that epiphany of like, I can track what my wife gets at the supermarket <laughs> on, a, on an app. Like I should be able to do that for patient care. Absolutely. And, you know, again, fortunately I had um Kevin Kether Romehilt, my my co-founder, who's a great user experience designer, helped build us, you know, a system that basically allows us to do just that in healthcare. And so um, you know, for me the I, I often tell a story like the Friday afternoon before Doc Health, I would leave the hospital feeling really stressed that I was gonna forget something, that uh all those sort of little to-dos that stacked up over the course of the week would somehow one or two of them would be forgotten or missed. And you know, I'd end up hearing about some patient that went, you know, ends up in the emergency room or some parent or colleague that's angry because I forgot to do something. And um, post doc health, uh, in my own practice, I, I had sort of that clarity of knowing what tasks need to be done, who is responsible for them. And I could honestly leave the hospital feeling, um, much more relief and that sort of, um, stress and weight on my shoulders on a Friday afternoon was, was gone, which was, you know, a powerful feeling that I really want to help other folks, uh, you know, feel the same experience. Yes, I, I'm grateful to hear your your sort of personal passion and mission behind the, the company. And I think that's a really critical part of innovation stories that resonate is to be able to understand the founders and what inspired them to do this work. And so, you know, hearing about your personal practice and how it changed as a result of this is that's powerful stuff. Could you tell us some more 
of the innovation stories coming out of Doc Health, or or in, it, actually, I'd broaden it too to any of your innovation work because you touch so many different um, spaces. So, you know, what what other innovation stories or storytelling strategies do you find yourself leaning in on, and and you find being effective for getting buy in or funding or uh, customers? Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, you know, I guess <laughs> just some uh, resounding sort of messages. You know, I, as a clinical director of innovation, I you know tried to help many, many a uh, hopeful entrepreneur or, or many a, a provider or clinician or researcher try and take their ideas from you know a concept to reality. And I, I think, as you pointed out, you know, the storytelling is essential. The ability to communicate clearly what is the problem you're trying to solve. And I think, you know, having come out of an innovation program, you know, uh, embedded within a, a children's hospital, um, you know, you see many, um, you know, many issues that people are looking to solve. And, you know, we spent the early days of the innovation program trying to build solutions um, to, you know, research projects or, or things that um, people perceived as, as real problems. And we found that although we helped build out some of these solutions, they, they weren't sustainable business ventures. And so they often died on the vine. Um, and so, you know, in sort of version two of our innovation program, um, we really sought to not only help providers um, you know, take their ideas and, and sort of uh, take them to the next level, but really focus on the ones that had some commercial opportunity and value, potential for sustainability. And so Doc was kind of one of the, the early sort of the second phase of innovations. And, you know, it was uh, clearly a, a passion project of mine. And we spent lots of time validating it and refining it and, and using the sort of wonderful uh, test bed of, of, you know, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and then, uh, you know, validating it externally. And so we found that there were people willing to pay for this solution that we had built. And ultimately, it became um, something that was worth actually going to talk to, you know, venture capitalists about, you know, really spinning out a company and then uh, putting some real funding behind it to, to move it to the next level. And so, you know, it's a, it's a process. And I think uh, sourcing problems at the rock face and, um, really trying to solve real clinical problems, not, you know, not in you know, problems, you know, uh, there's nothing worse than seeing, you know, these brilliant, um, you know, technical solutions to problems that don't actually exist. So, um, again, having come from a clinical program, seeing real problems, uh, you know, that clinicians and parents and providers and, and administrative folks are, are facing and actually trying to solve them, I think is is a powerful um, process to, to be part of. It sounds like, of course, you had personal experience with with this problem of, of having so many items on the to-do list, so much administrative work, but it sounds like your organization overall also was constantly listening to the voice of your consumer, right? It's, to the voices of providers and, um, and care teams who were burdened with this and trying to, it sounds like you were able to spark quite a bit of momentum based on that shared understanding of all this work really leads to burnout so fast. Yeah, it's interesting. I'll tell you the, you know, the electronic health records get all the blame for burnout. Um, and this is part of my personal mission is really trying to uh, you know, not not to defend them, uh, but but to kind of uh, refocus the blame on uh, you know the the sort of moral injury that uh, Dr. Z and others talk about. Um, you know, the challenge is just simply not having the right tools to help do our best work. Um, and for me, it was um, really just dealing with all the sort of uh, to dos that come as part of good clinical care. That you know, I, I want a better way to communicate with my team to take good care of my patients. And the electronic health records, you know, their their forms of communication are email inboxes that are you know of the style of um, the email inbox I had uh, you know 20 years ago. Um, and so, you know, again, bringing in things like secure messaging, bringing in things like secure task management and, and ways for people to collaborate and communicate in a modern consumer-like way are things that I, I think we all need. And again, I think the, the EMRs just get all the blame for all the burnout, but the reality is that it's the lack of the systems. Um, you know, we use post-it notes and email to do 
do the things that doc health is trying to replace. Um, so anyway, I think it's just really supporting the providers, um, with the right tools for the right job. Sure. Sure. Can you tell us too about culture change inside of an industry like healthcare, where it's hot, it's a high reliability industry, you know, safety is always the number one concern. Um, and therefore it can be one of a, a vertical where, you know, change can come a little bit more slowly, typically. Um, how do you, have you noticed certain cultural or systematic, um, you know, changes that had needed to happen in order for certain technologies and uh, certain new platforms to be accepted and implemented well? Yeah, that's, it's a great question. Um, and gosh, there's so much to that. Um, I, I would say certainly change management is likely difficult in all industries. I think <laughs> yes. I feel it particularly <laughs> challenging, particularly challenging in healthcare because of the entrenched um, sort of workflows and, and incum- incumbent systems like a you know, an electronic health record and email, for example, or, you know, post-it notes. But um, so, you know, I think people, uh, my experience, you know, having at least um, worked in innovation and and obviously in healthcare, um, you know, the sort of clinical enterprise and the, you know, the administrative and clinical components of that, uh, people are very loath to change. Um, And so, you know, I guess like any um, innovation, there are the early adopters. And I think finding those early adopters and clinical champions to help kind of, um, you know, really carry uh, your platform forward within a group is always essential. Um, and so part of, again, just hearkening back to my experience with um, Tiger Text and Secure Messaging, you know, I was that early adopter clinical champion that helped ultimately get Tiger Text into Boston Children's Hospital and, and you know, the the rest of that is history. But, um, you know, we're kind of taking a similar tact in that, you know, we want to find clinical champions, early adopters that are going to help bring what I think is a really transformative tool into their clinical practice. And it may start in small groups, you know, in, you know, a a small clinical practice within a large enterprise or simply a a small practice that is a little bit um, more nimble than an enterprise. But finding those clinical champions and the sort of early adopters and that grassroots effort, um, you know, we've we've really intended to try and make it as easy for those folks as possible to get on board. We've made our app entirely self-service so they can sign a BAA right through the app um, and, again, tried to make it really easy and consumer-like so that, um, you know, minimize the barrier to entry. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, but, you know, ultimately selling into the enterprise and, um, you know, all the sort of, you know, death by committee that may occur there is challenging and we're going to have to face that in the coming uh, months and years as we, as we grow. Sure. Yes, of course. And I think that that's a natural moment of growth for, for any startup, especially rapid growth one like Doc Health. So I would love, you know, looking back on your years in innovation as a startup founder now, could you share some advice before we wrap up our conversation, um, especially advice around how to communicate your innovation well and get buy-in? Well, that's it. And again, you ask good questions. Um, <laughs> I, I think you it, have it great is, answers. <laughs> well, thanks. I don't know if this one's going to count, but we'll see. Um, I, you know, I think it, it is, I mean, to your point, it is about storytelling. And I think, um, you know, my, my own experience has, has been a journey in that, you know, when I first started using PowerPoint slides, you know, many years ago, I had everything I wanted to say on the slide. And, you know, <laughs> um, I learned over time that the less you have in the slide, the better, right? Sure, so yes. The more that you can show a picture, but but tell a story that, um, you know, your users can connect with. I think the same is true of any, uh, you know, any sort of presentation, uh, whether it's, you know, verbal or, or, you know, slide form. It's, you know, telling a compelling story, you know, um, for me in, in, with Doc, it's, about you know, telling users, uh, or sorry, whether it's an investor or a potential user, you know, telling them my story, that Friday afternoon story, or the sort of potential use cases, uh, putting it in their context. So when we talk to a prospective client, you know, if it's a um, a mental health practice, for example, we talk about the mental health use cases of Doc Health, and we put ourselves in their shoes and do our best to kind of communicate a story that is relevant to them, and so. I think that is one of the powers or benefits that we have is that we've got, you know, um, 
you know, clinician um, founded company you know, to has a basis in the medicine and, and the sort of communities we're trying to sell to so that we can tell a compelling and realistic story of, you know, here's the issues that you might be having. Here's how we, we can help solve them. Uh, so I think it's, it's again, uh, as we started off with starting to tell compelling stories that matter to the, you know, to the recipient, to the listener, um, and, and being honest and transparent about, you know, not trying to be a salesman, but just, you know, telling, uh, something that you're passionate about that goes a long way. Yes, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think the thing I'll, I'll take away from our whole conversation is just that deep understanding of your audience, of your consumer, the people who you're trying to help solve a problem with or for, you know, your understanding of their experiences will be the make or break knowledge that will determine your success. And if you can tell that story of the problem back to them in a way that's clear and relatable and um, compelling to them, then you've really, that that's such a key to making that solution be viable in their minds. And so, well, I, I'm so grateful for the time that we've had together. I, I also just have to ask one last question, Michael, which is your last name is spelled D O C K T O R. Did you just feel as though you needed to be a doctor when you were a child? <laughs> uh, you know, there was kind of no choice in the matter, as you, <laughs> as you might imagine. No, um, I don't know. My parents tell me that from like the earliest ages, uh, I was, you know, drawn to science and uh, always wanted to be a doctor you know i can't imagine that my name didn't have something to do with it but, uh, <laughs> we, we do have video evidence of me at like a birthday party when i was five years old saying that i wanted to be a doctor when i grew up so Aww, but, um, that's very it sweet is, uh, something that i'm very um proud to have uh you know been part of my world and, and certainly excited now to have a a new sort of venture and, uh, you know, in entrepreneurship, but yeah, yes. my name probably played a role certainly opened <laughs> doors and, and was a good icebreaker. <laughs> I love that, that image of you as a five-year-old saying that. So thank you for sharing that. I was, I've been curious about that during the entire conversation. <laughs> so Michael, thank you so much. Thank you for the, to the doc health team for making time to be on the podcast and be featured today. And you. Um, you can follow Michael at Michael doctor on Twitter and Instagram, and you can follow doc health at D O C K health. Thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. <laughs>